15. Too much blood sugar or too little. The way the body works is largely a matter of keeping the organs and tissues in a pretty constant environment inside the body. Anything, for example, that makes the level of sugar, glucose, in your blood fall below normal or rise above normal is promptly followed by actions that restore it to its original level. These actions are controlled partly by the nervous system, but chiefly by the hormones. If for any reason the control mechanisms are not working properly, you will have an excessive amount of sugar in the blood, or a deficient amount, for part or all of the time. The condition of a high blood sugar is called hyperglycemia, and that of a low blood sugar, hypoglycemia. Diabetes the commonest cause of hyperglycemia is diabetes. Diabetes, more strictly diabetes mellitus, is a disease that has been studied in very great detail for quite a long time, certainly over a hundred years. Research workers are still, however, not at all clear about several features of the disease. In trying to summarize what we do know, I shall inevitably have to make it sound much simpler than it really is. I shall have also to be much more dogmatic than the limitations of our current knowledge warrant. Broadly speaking, diabetes occurs mostly either in children or in middle-aged men and women. Juvenile diabetes tends to run in families rather more than does maturity-onset diabetes. Again, when children with diabetes grow up, they are usually quite thin. Maturity-onset diabetes is most commonly found in overweight people. Most patients with juvenile diabetes respond well to treatment with insulin, while most of those with maturity-onset diabetes are more resistant to the action of insulin. As a result, it is now more usual to classify patients as insulin-dependent or non-insulin-dependent. Yet another way of classifying diabetes is into type 1 and type 2. However, in practice, it is quite common, especially among non-white, non-Caucasian patients, to find individuals who do not clearly belong to either of these types. Soon after von Mering and Minkowski showed in 1890 that diabetes could be produced in the dog by the removal of its pancreas, it became evident that groups of cells in the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans were responsible for producing a substance that prevented diabetes. An effective preparation of this substance was made by Banting and Best in 1921. The substance was given the appropriate name insulin. Insula is the Latin word for island. It was natural then to imagine that all cases of diabetes were caused by a failure of the islets of Langerhans to produce enough insulin. But it is now known that this is not always true. On the whole, such a failure is the most common cause of type 1 diabetes, but not of type 2. The latter condition is often due to an insensitivity of the cells of the body to insulin. One of the most important actions of insulin is that of enabling the cells to utilize the glucose from the blood, which is their main source of fuel. If, however, the cells have become insensitive to insulin, the pancreas produces more and more insulin in order to counteract the insensitivity. It used to be usual to treat all forms of diabetes with injections of insulin. Nowadays, however, it is more common to treat type 2 diabetes patients with drugs by mouth. These drugs mostly fall into two groups, those that increase insulin secretion by the pancreas and those that seem to increase the sensitivity of the cells to the insulin that is already being secreted by the pancreas. Even if their diabetes has been kept under quite good control by insulin injections or by oral treatment, Patients are likely, after several years, to develop a number of other conditions, including peripheral vascular disease and coronary thrombosis. In addition, 
Diabetes can result in diseases of the eye, cataract and retinitis, and disease of the kidney. No one quite understands why these complications arise, although it may be partly because of long-standing abnormal blood sugar levels or because of other abnormal substances in the blood, such as ketone bodies. As I shall show in Chapter 19, there is reason to believe that arterial disease may arise from a continuing high level of insulin. I shall then discuss the interesting association between diabetes, overweight, and arterial disease, and the fact that people with any of these conditions are likely to have excessive insulin in the blood. There are several reasons why I believe that eating too much sugar is one cause of diabetes, mostly of type 2 diabetes, but possibly type 1 too. First, there is the epidemiological evidence. Much of it parallels what I have already cited for coronary thrombosis, but here the evidence is fraught with even more difficulties. In some ways, one could have expected an association between diabetes and dietary sugar, or any other environmental factor, to be simpler than that for coronary thrombosis, because diabetes is more readily diagnosed during life. But in fact, not many countries have the facilities for the large-scale and fairly elaborate surveys that would be needed to detect early diabetes. And as for mortality statistics, the difficulty here is that people with diabetes often die of one or other of the many complications of the disease, and the death may then be certified as having been due to the complications rather than to the diabetes itself. So science is on rather uncertain ground about the prevalence of diabetes, and I can only give you the views that are commonly but not universally held by the experts. They believe that diabetes in the well-off countries is much more prevalent today than it used to be. If you look for it carefully by checking for sugar, glucose, in the urine, or testing the level of glucose in the blood, you can find at least mild diabetes in something like 2% of the population in Western countries. Currently, it is on the whole more prevalent in these countries than in the poorer countries. Among the people of Indian descent studied by Dr. G. D. Campbell in Natal, South Africa, there is a much higher prevalence than in India itself. The average intake of sugar in Natal is said to be 110 pounds or more a year. In India, it is between 15 and 20 pounds a year. Moreover, there is much more disease among fairly wealthy Natal Indians than among the poorer. One other epidemiological study worth mentioning is that of Dr. E. Ziegler of Switzerland. He compared the mortality due to diabetes in Switzerland with sugar intake, using a rather novel method of assessing this as the sugar climate, the total amount of sugar consumed over a period of years. He then demonstrated that the mortality from diabetes over a period of 20 years is correlated, both in men and women, with this sugar climate. The view that diabetes may be caused by eating sugar has long been held by many people. The name sugar diabetes, of course, refers to the fact that sugar, glucose, is found in the urine of affected persons. But people also take the name to refer to dietary sugar as a cause of the disease, as well as to one of its symptoms. Again, for more than a hundred years before insulin was discovered, it was known that diets low in carbohydrates, and especially in sugar, were the best treatment for diabetes. Yet the first detailed epidemiological evidence, put forward by Sir Harold Himsworth some fifty years ago, suggested that the disease was associated most closely with fat consumption. He showed that the mortality from the disease in different countries was often proportional to the average amounts of fat in local diets. But he himself expressed surprise that this was so, knowing that a diet high in fat was the currently accepted treatment for the disease. Himsworth wrote, 
The dietary factor which parallels these changes in mortality and prevalence of diabetes most closely is the consumption of fat, and this correlation is surprisingly consistent. We are thus left with the paradox that, though the consumption of fat has no deleterious influence on sugar tolerance, and fat diets actually reduce the susceptibility of animals to diabetogenic agents, the incidence of human diabetes is correlated with the amount of fat consumed. Looking at the problem again some years later, I wondered whether Himsworth's difficulty arose from making the common assumption that all carbohydrate was equivalent. Since total carbohydrate consumption is similar in most countries, there was no reason to suspect carbohydrates as a cause of diabetes. But when you consider the different forms of carbohydrate, then you find that the prevalence of diabetes is more closely related to the amount of dietary sugar than to dietary fat. This is especially true if you take into account the probability that it may take 20 years or so for the diet to produce diabetes, as Dr. Campbell suggests. When I related the number of people dying of diabetes in different countries to the amount of sugar or fat that was eaten some 20 years earlier, I found a high correlation with sugar and no correlation with fat. The sort of relationship with fat that is sometimes found, and was found by Himsworth, comes about because, as I pointed out, average fat consumption in different countries is frequently related to their sugar consumptions. The most likely explanation of the situation, then, is that sugar intake is a cause of diabetes, and fat intake is only secondarily related to diabetes through its association with sugar intake. A year before I made these observations, a very interesting paper appeared from Professor Aharon Cohen in Israel. He examined people for the presence of diabetes, and his study was especially interesting for two reasons. First, it was made on Jews, who were said to have more diabetes than non-Jews. Second, he was able to compare people of four different backgrounds— people from Western Europe and America, others from North Africa, others from the Yemen who had recently arrived in Israel, and some from the Yemen who had arrived twenty or more years earlier. All but the recent immigrants from the Yemen had a similar prevalence of diabetes, but the recent Yemeni immigrants had a prevalence of 0.06%, compared with 2.9% for the early Yemeni immigrants. Later, Cohen and his colleagues showed, as I mentioned in relation to his study on heart disease, that the major change in the diet of the Yemenis in Israel was a great increase in sugar consumption. There was very little change in their fat intake. While I was in the process of revising this section of Pure, White and Deadly for the current edition, a paper appeared in the British Medical Journal reporting a survey of the prevalence of diabetes in 34,000 Asians and 27,000 Europeans living near London. It transpired that diabetes was nearly four times as common in the Asians as in the Europeans. According to Dr. Tom Sanders, who is working in the Nutrition Department of Queen Elizabeth College and has been making a special study of the diets of Asian immigrants, they eat significantly more sugar than do the Europeans among whom they live. In addition to these epidemiological studies, there is now quite a lot of experimental evidence that sugar may produce diabetes. Again, some of the early studies were those of Professor Cohen, and my colleagues and I have confirmed his results. Rats fed with sugar develop a decreased glucose tolerance, resembling the condition seen in diabetes. That is, when a dose of glucose is given by mouth to a fasted animal, the already high level of glucose increases to a still more abnormal level and does not return to the fasting level within the usual one and a half to two hours. Cohen showed that this impairment of glucose tolerance occurred in rats after three weeks or so 
when there was 67% sugar in the diet, after six weeks when it contained 40% of sugar, and after about 13 weeks with 33% sugar. The glucose tolerance recovered after a few days on the normal diet. When sugar feeding was resumed, it deteriorated again, but this time after only a few days. Later, Professor Cohen worked for a few months in my department, and again we studied the effects of feeding sugar to rats. This time we injected tolbutamide, one of the drugs used in the treatment of diabetes. This stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin which lowers the blood glucose level. We argued that if the sugar diet had made the rat somewhat diabetic, it would not be using glucose as well as it normally did. Tolbutamide would then have a lesser effect in lowering the blood glucose. This is just what we found. In one experiment, after eight weeks, the injection lowered the blood glucose by 31% in the starch-fed rats and by 26% in the sugar-fed rats. In a second experiment, the figures were 32% and 27%. In human subjects, a high sugar diet maintained for several weeks had been shown to reduce sugar tolerance, and a low sugar diet for several weeks has been shown to improve it. We ourselves measured glucose tolerance in the experiment with young men that I described earlier, in which they were fed a high-sucrose diet for two weeks. In the first of these experiments, we found no change. In the second experiment, we found an improvement in glucose tolerance after one week and a slight reversion toward the normal after the second week. This may seem strange. In fact, it is not at all surprising. The first effect of the sugar would be to improve the body's use of glucose by the common process of adaptation. It would do this either by improving production of insulin from the pancreas or by improving sensitivity of the body tissues to the action of insulin. But by continuing to give a high sugar diet, adaptation would diminish and exhaustion take its place and the use of glucose would now be less than normal. Thus, the improvement in glucose tolerance that we showed after one week would not contradict the deterioration that people found after several weeks, nor would there be a conflict in the fact that we found no change in our first experiment. We might very well have made our measurements at a point where developing deterioration just about cancelled out the initial improvements induced by the sugar. Apart from the decreased glucose tolerance that is found in diabetes, there are other noteworthy characteristics of the disease. At this point, it will be convenient to discuss these in some detail in relation to the experiments that we and others have done with sugar. Long-standing diabetes often causes deterioration of vision because of the development of abnormalities in the retina a condition known as diabetic retinopathy, or retinitis. Several years ago, Professor Aharon Cohen showed that dietary sugar produced abnormalities of the eye in the rat. By using a very delicate technique that measures the electrical response of the retina to a flash of light, he and his colleagues found a diminished response in rats fed sugar. This observation was followed by a more detailed study by a London group that included one of my colleagues. They concluded from careful biochemical and microscopic examination that the retinal abnormalities produced by the sugar were identical with those found in diabetic rats. As well as producing an increase in the size of the liver, sugar in the diet also results in enlargement of the kidneys. Quite early on in the story of the research into the effects of dietary sugar, Professor Aharon Cohen showed that the kidneys of his sugar-fed rats were abnormal, with, among other things, an increase of fibrous tissue between the blood capillaries. After this discovery, we ourselves became increasingly interested in the effects of sugar on the kidneys. There were two reasons for this. 
The main one was our increasing realization of their close similarity to the effects of diabetes, and the second was the happy coincidence that Dr. R. G. Price of the Biochemistry Department of Queen Elizabeth College had for a long time been carrying out research on the biochemical changes occurring in various diseases of the kidney. He and his associates had found that a very early sign of damage to the kidney was the appearance in the urine of a considerably increased quantity of a particular enzyme. This has the rather elaborate name, even when shortened, of N-acetyl-beta-glucosaminidase, but is known familiarly as NAG. This is just as well, since its full name is in fact 56 characters long, as against the 23 of the short form. Given a diet with sugar, rats show an increase in NAG in the urine, and so do human volunteers who increase their sugar intake. After the rats had been taking the sugar diet for a year, it was possible to detect small calcified deposits in the kidney. I would not claim that this proves that sugar can be one of the causes of kidney stones. If it is, it is certainly not the only one, since kidney stones occur in populations that take little sugar and are known to have been common long before sugar became a sizable item of our diet in the wealthier countries. On the other hand, since most kidney stones contain calcium oxalate, or uric acid, it is perhaps relevant that dietary sugar has been reported as increasing the amounts of these materials in the urine. The researchers who did this work have also said that patients with kidney stones have a low glucose tolerance, like that found in diabetics. Our own work on the kidney at Queen Elizabeth College, however, has revealed what I think is the most striking evidence of the relationship between dietary sugar and the development of diabetes. We examined the kidneys of sugar-fed animals with the electron microscope, which takes photographs at magnifications of 10,000 or more. We looked especially at membranes of the cells that make up the vast number of tiny filter units, the glomerular capillaries, where the blood is filtered as the first stage in the elaborate process of producing urine. We noticed that these cell membranes were much thicker than they normally are. This was especially interesting because thickening of what is called the glomerular basement membrane, GBM, is accepted as the most characteristic abnormality found in diabetes among patients who develop diabetic nephropathy, that is, kidney disease. Proceeding from this, some very sophisticated biochemical procedures were carried out, in which the glomerular basement membranes were separated and measurements made of their constituents. We got good evidence for an increased production of GBM by showing that several of the particular chemical units making up the membrane were present in larger amounts in the sugar-fed rats, and that there was greater activity of the enzyme involved in making the GBM with these units. These abnormalities produced by sugar are exactly similar to those present in rats that develop diabetes for other reasons. The importance of this research can be judged from the fact that in the UK, something like 15% of patients with kidney failure, whether or not they are being treated with dialysis or kidney transplant, have developed their condition from diabetes, while in America it accounts for 25% of patients undergoing treatment for kidney disease. In type 2 diabetes, the main feature of the disease is not a failure of the pancreas to produce its normal quantity of insulin, but a failure of the body's tissue to react sufficiently to the insulin that is produced. This can quite easily be shown in the laboratory. A small piece of tissue is put into a vessel, and one or other of the metabolic processes involving insulin is measured. For instance, you can put some glucose with a piece of muscle tissue in a closed vessel and see how rapidly it uses oxygen or produces carbon dioxide as the tissue oxidizes the glucose. 
or you can put a piece of fatty tissue into a vessel and measure the rate at which new fat is produced. If you now do the same experiment and add insulin, you find that the oxidation or the fat formation has been measurably speeded up. But if you repeat all this with a piece of tissue from a diabetic animal or a person with type 2 diabetes, the addition of insulin makes little or no difference to the speed of these reactions. In other words, the diabetic tissue is insulin-resistant. The same phenomenon, though usually less pronounced, can be seen in people who are significantly overweight. This is another fact that I shall return to later. Similar experiments have been carried out with animals fed sugar for some weeks. They were first reported by research workers in Czechoslovakia and later by ourselves at Queen Elizabeth College. Both in muscle and in fatty tissue, the inclusion of sugar in the animal's diet produces insulin resistance. In one of our experiments, the rate of fat synthesis in fatty tissue from starch-fed animals increased by about 140% when insulin was added. In fatty tissue taken from sugar-fed animals, on the other hand, insulin produced no increase at all. The difference between the effects of short-term feeding of sugar and the effects of longer-term feeding can be important, although they are often ignored. It is commonly said that the concentration of glucose in the blood before breakfast, the so-called fasting blood glucose concentration, which is elevated in diabetics, is not affected by adding sugar to a meal on the previous day. Nor does this affect the glucose tolerance, the response of blood glucose concentration to a dose of glucose, nor the simultaneous response of the insulin concentration. But this must not be taken to mean that sugar may be consumed by a diabetic, even in moderate quantities, as a regular part of the diet. As we have seen it, it only requires the regular consumption of sugar each day for two or three weeks to produce a significant decrease in glucose tolerance and in susceptible people a significant increase in the insulin concentration in fasting blood. Unfortunately, a lot of the recent research that claims that a diabetic can take sugar with impunity depends on the results of tests with sugar given in a single meal. Finally, I should like to mention the relationship between diabetes and coronary disease, which works both ways. On the one hand, if you are a diabetic, you have a greater than normal chance of suffering from coronary disease. On the other hand, if you have coronary disease, you have a greater than normal chance of developing diabetes, or at least of having an impaired glucose tolerance that is sometimes called preclinical diabetes. I believe this sort of overlap is important when you come to try to understand how sugar can be involved in causing these two diseases. Hypoglycemia The people who know this condition best are diabetics. Sooner or later they run into the situation of having taken too much insulin or too much of one of the new oral drugs and they get the very uncomfortable symptoms of hypoglycemia, a low blood glucose level, sometimes even leading to unconsciousness. But hypoglycemia also occurs in many people who are not diabetics, although they rarely get it so severely as to become unconscious. You begin by feeling hungry and weak, and you may begin to sweat. You may then start shaking feel faint and dizzy and get a severe headache. If the condition persists, you may get mentally confused, stagger about and speak indistinctly or nonsensically. At this point you could even be arrested for being drunk and disorderly. All these symptoms have arisen because your blood glucose has fallen to an abnormally low level. It is easy to understand how this happens to diabetics who may have taken their insulin or a pill to lower the blood sugar 
and then missed their normal breakfast because of some interruption. It is also easy to understand how it occurs in the rare circumstances when a patient has a tumour of the pancreas, causing an overgrowth of its insulin-making cells. The way it happens in other people is most commonly because of the consumption of a lot of carbohydrates, especially sugar. The effect of eating any meal is to increase the level of blood sugar. If sugar or starch or glucose is in the meal, then all or part of it turns up in the blood quite quickly as glucose. If protein or fat is in the meal, then their digestion products too will be in part converted into glucose, but more slowly. In addition, they slow down the absorption of all food. The rise in blood glucose is only temporary, because one of its effects is to stimulate the pancreas to produce more insulin. This causes both an increase in the breakdown of the blood glucose and an increase in its conversion into glycogen to be stored in the muscles and liver. As a result, the level of glucose falls back toward normal. A more than normally rapid absorption of a great deal of glucose occurs if a lot of sugar is consumed, especially if it is taken between meals when there are no other food constituents in the stomach that might delay absorption. There is then a rapid rise of blood glucose and an excessive amount of insulin is secreted. Because of this, the subsequent fall of blood glucose is excessive. The level becomes abnormally low, and if it is low enough, symptoms of hypoglycemia will appear. There is some evidence, too, that continued high intake of sugar can, at least for a time, result in an increased sensitivity of the pancreas, so that it responds more readily still with the increased secretion of insulin, and hypoglycemia becomes even more likely. How then do you treat hypoglycemia? Well, if you don't bother to think out the consequences of the process I have just described, clearly you treat a person with low blood sugar by giving them a lump of sugar to eat or a sugary drink, and the effect is pretty miraculous. Within a few minutes, all the sweating and weakness and dizziness disappear. But now think back for a moment and you will see that this, however effective, is in the long run just what should not be done, because the rapid rise in blood glucose may be followed by a rapid fall. What you must do is to prevent these large swings in blood glucose. Only foods that result in a gentle rise in blood sugar should be eaten, so that an excessive output of insulin by the pancreas is not evoked. That is why the best treatment for a lack of sugar, glucose, in the blood is the paradoxical treatment of avoiding sugar, sucrose, in your diet as much as possible. Let me say a word here about hypoglycemia in babies. Premature babies sometimes suffer from hypoglycemia, presumably because their hormonal control of the level of blood glucose has not yet become properly balanced. This can be quite serious, and premature babies have been known to become unconscious or even die from hypoglycemia. Because this is an acute and hazardous situation, the best treatment in such an emergency is to give them sugar, sucrose, or still better, to give them glucose by mouth or even intravenously. One would expect that babies not born prematurely would not develop hypoglycemia so readily, but might still be rather more sensitive to the damaging effect of sugar than adults. When you consider how soon babies are given sugar, and how much, it is perhaps not so surprising that there appears to be an increase in the number of babies who develop hypoglycemia when they are a few months old. There seems to be a belief, especially in America, that hypoglycemia is quite common. My own view is that, although hypoglycemia is not exactly rare, it does not occur as commonly as is often claimed. In particular, the repeated assertion, again especially in America, 
that dietary sugar may cause hyperactivity in children and delinquency in young people has not been substantiated. It is said that both of these conditions are related to hypoglycemia and can be cured by eliminating sugar from the diet, or at least considerably reducing it. In spite of the suggestion that these claims have been demonstrated by carefully conducted experiments, closer scrutiny of the methods used shows that the case is far from being proved. The Relationship Between Coronary Heart Disease and Diabetes I have described in some detail why I think sugar is one of the causes of diabetes and also of coronary thrombosis. These are not the only conditions in which I believe sugar is involved, but they are probably the most important ones. Before I turn to these other conditions, however, I am going to summarize the arguments I used in relation to coronary disease because, apart from bringing together what I have had to spread over many pages, it would also help to make clear the close relationship between coronary disease and diabetes. We can best do this by outlining the major features of coronary heart disease. These are 1. The wide range of abnormalities found in patients. 2. The multiplicity of causes, which include cigarette smoking, lack of physical activity, excess weight, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetes. 3. The difference in incidence between men and women. 4. The association with other diseases, notably diabetes, but also high blood pressure, gout, gallbladder disease, peptic ulcer, and peripheral vascular disease. I have set out in the table features in which abnormalities are commonly seen in coronary heart disease and diabetes type 2, some of the more important abnormalities found in coronary heart disease. All of these are also found in maturity-onset diabetes. It is difficult to believe that this wide range of abnormalities seen in heart disease can arise simply from a disturbance in the way the body deals with dietary fat, or simply from a disturbance in the body's control of the amount of cholesterol in the blood. It is much more likely that such a complex of relationships and abnormalities is caused by a disturbance of hormone balance. In particular, insulin, cortisol and estrogen affect many of the body's functions and much of the body's chemistry. More than this, a disturbance in the activity of one of these hormones usually leads to a disturbance in the activity of one or more of the other hormones. It is then not difficult to imagine that the result might well be the laying of the foundations of more than one disease. The suggestion that coronary heart disease is brought about by a disturbed balance of the body's hormones is not new, although some of the earlier suggestions have now been almost forgotten. The possible role of hormones may be inferred almost automatically from the considerable protection women have before the menopause. The original suggestion about hormone involvement was made as long ago as 1956. A group of workers then pointed out that young women with diabetes are especially liable to develop coronary heart disease and suggested that their loss of immunity to coronary atherosclerosis could be due to the effects of the insulin injections they are given. And in 1961, another group of researchers wrote, Clearly any statement regarding the etiology, cause, of coronary heart disease will have to explain the sex ratio. And they go on to say that this strongly suggests a hormonal cause of the disease. Other workers, too, have suggested that coronary thrombosis could be due to an abnormally high concentration of insulin in the circulating blood. There are several pieces of evidence to support this suggestion, the most obvious being that most patients with the disease have a high level of insulin in the blood. In addition, 
Several of the agreed causes of coronary disease are often accompanied by a high insulin concentration in the blood. These include cigarette smoking, excess weight, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetes type 2. Thirdly, loss of excess weight and increased physical activity, both of which reduce the risk of developing coronary disease, result in a fall in insulin levels. Fourthly, Experiments with rats have shown that administration of insulin produces an increased amount of cholesterol deposited in the body's main artery, the aorta. As for sugar, the most relevant fact is that every one of the abnormalities seen in coronary heart disease and in diabetes can be produced by the inclusion of sugar in the diet.